Again, I don't uh, know what to say. <laughs> don't, it, don't edit that out, please. Hello, welcome to Swiss Watch Gang, and today we are in Amsterdam visiting this legend, Jasper Liefler Lierling. Dobrodan Kurtic. Do Dobrodan. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, bro. Thank you for hosting in your beautiful home. Cheers, huh? It is honestly, it's a, it's a great pleasure and it's an honor to be in your show. I've watched, let's say, maybe two episodes. Yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding, seriously, you're doing It's like the average viewer, you know, so no, yeah. No, no, seriously, I'm very, very glad to be on this channel, presenting a part of my collection that will consist of some of my private watches. And I added, because I'm slightly commercial, I added some pieces that will be up for sale or perhaps are already for sale. But most of them have a special story to it. Perfect, that's good to hear, man. So I have no idea about vintage watches, we could say it like this, I'm not, the channel isn't known for vintage watches. So I think it's cool and refreshing to talk to somebody who is considered an expert in the industry. I don't know why, but people seem to like really come to you for advice. I think it's the glasses, <laughs> it, it, it makes me look smart. <laughs> exactly, the, the glasses. glasses. make me trust people. <laughs> so I'm happy to see what's in the box. We did a video on your channel with my watches with a similar concept. So today you want to return the favor and shock me with some Rolex watches I have no idea about. So tell me, before we dive into the watches, how did you, how did you start and where are we today here in Amsterdam? So this is the lounge, so next door is the store. This is basically more of a, um, let's say, living room setting. We have the bar here, we have a dining table over there, we have the bedroom over there, bathroom over there. You're staying here now for two or yeah. three days. Yeah. Thank so you. we do uh, offer the opportunity for international clientele and friends to visit Amsterdam and get the full Amsterdam Vintage Watches experience, staying here nice. while picking up or selling your beautiful beloved watch. And we're spending here a lot of time with a lot of clients, a lot of collectors, showing watches to each other, you know, the drill. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's what we do here. The typical stuff. Huh? Exactly. So, I haven't seen the watches in the box. Correct. Of course. You cover many cool pieces on your channel as well, so I'm gonna link in the description below. So definitely check those out if you like vintage watches, or if you just wanna dive into this topic, because it's a very, difficult topic I think to learn about and also you have to be cautious who to follow and who to listen to so surprise me what's the what are you gonna pull out the box first so mainly it's filled with Rolex watches because that's my true passion mm -hmm. I love vintage Rolex watches also mine of course I know you're very knowledgeable also <laughs> so I don't have to tell you anything about them but no, so let's for the audience the sake <laughs> let's tell a little bit about those watches um, furthermore I would like to start if I may uh, with the watch that's on my wrist. Yes, I saw this, it's very cool, huh? What do you have? That's very interesting because it was gracing my wrist this morning and he said that he very much disliked <laughs> the watch. And that's the exact re reason why I kept it on. Because I was about to pair it with a, date it with a Stella Dow in the same color of my shirt. Yes. But then you made all the nasty comments the about- The cringe comments, yes. Yeah. So I'll keep wearing my AP that has a real time function combined with a perpetual calendar in platinum uh, very fairly priced, if I may say so. Like for the value, you're getting a lot of bang. The case back looks nice. It has the open worked rotor. You have the display case back. Uh, again, it's in platinum, so it's a pretty hefty piece. Mm -hmm. They have different finishes. So the side of the case is sandblasted. The top bezel is high polished finish. And the numerals are like uh, consistent with the dial. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's a very spectacular piece in design, but also ingenuity and craftsmanship uh, compared to, let's say, a lot of other watches you buy in this uh, price range at 25,000 euros. Good price point for a platinum watch for Patrick, make an offer. <laughs> no, don't, don't. Let's start off with uh, okay, I'm not gonna watch. a watch that has my one of my favorite anecdotes connected to it. Oh, the 1654. <laughs> Leave the references to me, bro. It's nothing spectacular in regards to the history or the configuration or originality or whatever condition four years ago. Uh, we got set up in Argentina, a friend of mine and I, and there was like this motor gang from Venezuela yeah. that pulled up on us with guns, uh, four or five guns sticking to my head and to my friend's head. And they came for my watch, which was this watch, <laughs> uh, but it was inside information. So somebody tipped them off, probably the hotel mm -hmm. staff. So I lost the watch. And after they left, my friend was so terrified and traumatized that he started crying a lot. And I was a little bit, I don't want to sound cool, like, oh, I didn't care. But it, I, I brushed it off because yeah. nothing happened to us in the end. We only lost the watch, but he felt so sorry for me. Now, fast forward three or four years and I got the watch back because I listed it as stolen, like online on my website. Somebody found it in New York. I got the watch back. 
and I'm going to engrave it next week, cry no more and give it to my friend. Nice, nice, nice. So, so just as a cool. keepsake of a, a terrible tragedy that in the end turned into a funny <laughs> anecdote for this watch. Yeah, but thank God, like people, you know, it's probably not a nice experience. I can't imagine no. this happening to me. But again, as long as you survive and you still, you know, live to, to see another day, that's the most important thing. And don't worry, they don't steal this kind of crap. Uh, they only want like uh, the, genuine stuff. They, they wouldn't recognize this, yes, exactly. <laughs> so they, they probably got this and thought, oh. No, they wow. wouldn't recognize this either. The thing is, my assistant booked the hotel with my email address, Amsterdam Windows Watches. So probably the hotel staff sold or under threat yeah. gave the information course, to criminals. Of yeah. course, they thought it, they knew it's a vintage watch probably, which usually has a higher value. So. Yeah. So we have two watches on a leather strap. Let's add a third one. I like the dressy, classy feel of a Cartier oh, nice. on a leather strap. It just brings out the watch better oftentimes, not yeah. always. There are exceptions, but especially to a gentleman's piece like the Cartier Tank Cintré, also engraved, by the way. So this watch dating back to the 70s, which you can see by the octagonal crown. So the watches cannot be dated by the serial numbers, not per se, on these older watches. So it depends. They made the watch from the 1920s onwards to even now. Uh, the Centre is usually uh, preserved for special occasions, for example, the CPCP mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, but this is from the 70s, very, very clean condition. It's a watch that I rarely wear due to the size because it's too thick and too big for me. In yeah. my honest opinion, it's nine linea, so uh, that's the biggest size. They also have eight and seven linea. When I will find an eight linea, I will put that in my private collection. Mm -hmm. I'll sell this one. Whilst the Tank Centre is a, is a collectible piece that is a, has a small niche of collectors, including John Goldberger, Aura mm -hmm. Montanari, who has an amazing video about those two. Yeah. yeah. What do you want to do now? Patek or Rolex? I'm still not looking at the box, so... Let's stick to Patek, or go to Patek, and then we're starting with the most complicated watch in my collection. So it's not only a world time or Cancian Perpetual, but it's a perpetual calendar, it is. But then with a split second chronograph, Pui. the Rad Rapante 5004, made in platinum, with a black dial, pretty impressive piece. They made, uh, I think they started in 1996 and it discontinued in 2012, but they only made like 12 a year. It has a Le Mania et Bosch and it's not really made to house, let's say, the Rad Rapante complication. Mm -hmm. So it was a technical marvel that Patek was able to pull it off, but it took quite some time. This is so nice. So, so if somebody likes this watch, what's the entry level price point of these nowadays? Uh, 5004 in yellow gold are the least valuable. It starts at quarter million approximately. Yeah. But I would also definitely suggest you check out the 3970 first. So that is the watch that got me into the perpetual calendars with chronograph function. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of bang for your buck. You can pick those up like a yellow gold one for 120. In aesthetics, it's pretty similar. Obviously it has only one chronograph hand and it doesn't have this huge crown because the crown also houses the case for the chronograph. Well, that's that and at first I preferred the 3970. I had one in my collection for a long while, but then I fell in love with the crown, which I funnily enough disliked in the first place. I was like, that's just too bulky proportion wise. It doesn't add up, but now I really love it. It's like a long height almost, huh? With yeah, the but that's 10 times better. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. Sorry. Just kidding. Just kidding, bro. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we found the Sporty Tool watches by Patek Philippe. Most people also refer to the Nautilus oftentimes. But of course, we have the Aquanaut 2, which is definitely a cult classic with the rubber bracelet. But this is a spectacular piece, and I wonder if you know why it's so uncommon. Of course. This is a reference number <laughs> yeah, fuck made off. between uh, 82 and 84. The only one on the rubber strap with uh, you know, red dial. Yeah, there you go. You know, there you go. You have it, bro. Uh, it, but so it, it looks it's a plumb dial. Looks super nice. Huh? Yeah. So it's the old 5065. Yeah, 50, yeah. 5065. Yeah, it was on the tip of your tongue. Yes, just about to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's the old one. Uh, that uh, really has all the vintage features that I love. For example, the straight end links and the embossed like grenade pattern on the dial is way deeper. Cool. But most importantly, it's a plum dial or prune dial. And that was a order by a North American client who ordered this one and uh, next to a blue one and a green one, all unique with uh, consecutive serials. So this is a piece unique essentially. Well, I wouldn't say piece unique because it doesn't say piece unique, but this is the only one that's known to the market. But mm -hmm. it is possible that in four years time or five years time, somebody will see another one. And then I'm that idiot that called it a piece unique and it's yeah. not. But this is the only one that ever reached the market. So for um, now it is, it's a piece unique. <laughs> well, he said it though, he said it. No, I will show you the Rolex watches. That's what you came for because yes. you're a connoisseur. Uh, it's my passion, bro. But if you like watches, you can't dislike Rolex. Then you're a fucking idiot. All the other shit wouldn't have existed in the fashion they do. You have without to acknowledge Rolex. it, yeah. And if I show you these watches, 
your faith will change and you will start to like Rolex. And I'm talking vintage only. I'll friend. sell all my independence uh, just by Rolex. Well. well, I wouldn't say that, but <laughs> like have a healthy mix. Let's start off with a watch that really ignited my passion in the tool watch fashion, let's say, uh, mainly due to the elusiveness of this model. It's a Milgauss. It's a Milgauss. Yeah, Faraday cage. Uh, very good. <laughs> the bezel sectored in uh, five different divisions for no specific reason, six different divisions up until five on the numbers. So it's a very elusive, very weird watch. They introduced the 6543 firstly with a, like a lug width of 19 and a half millimeters. So weird, like it yeah. doesn't fit a proper bracelet. Very strange. And then they introduced this one, the 6543. They only made like a dozen. And this probably slightly over 100, 150. Very cool. Two weeks ago, the new old stock example uh, fetched 2.3 million at the auction, yeah. which was funny because I sold, in my hu humble opinion, I hate when people say that, like, I sold a better one, but <laughs> mine was better in condition, if you ask me and yeah. everybody that knows anything about Rolex. And the guy I sold it to, he paid half a million, he was standing next to me in the room, so he was very happy. Of course, of course. Uh, but the only reason I sold that watch wasn't for the money, but it was because I couldn't wear it because the condition was so good. And yeah. especially on tool watches, I like them beat up. Just like this one, tropical yeah. dial. Spider you know, dial as well. Spider dial. The lacquer was uh, well done, my friend. <laughs> this one I can just wear and enjoy. Oh, it's super cool. You know, you're right. With like vintage Rolex, they have much more soul to it. You know? There you go. Yeah. Than the modern ones. Because the modern ones you get, you see them, they're basically perfect, right? Yeah. So uh, on the Paul Newman, I chose this watch to show. Uh, I like this. You like it? Yeah. Yeah, there's a little bit more flair to it with the so-called exotic dial. 6239, a very early one for Paul Newman uh, in the serial range of 1967. So it still has like the 300 bezels. Well, I have another Paul Newman here. It's not in my collection, but I just wish to show you. This is a later one. You see the bezel layout being different. Units per hour is over here instead of at the one o'clock marker. Yeah. So this is the early one. Very and nice. this I like more because it's tricolore. So it's with the red in the yeah, minute track. track. Yeah. And this one only has red on the Daytona script. Yeah. So I prefer this one. Rookie mistake. Oh, this is much better. Oh, well, you're, you're a true connoisseur. So, so you if can... you want one, this is the one to get. If you have this one, <laughs> this ain't it, you know? This is amateur hour. Uh, this is the T-Swiss large dial. It even has like a crown marked on the glass. That's how you know it's a real one. No, huh? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> Be okay. careful what you say. I know it's a joke, but people will see it. And then they no, will again, again if you want to know about vintage watches, definitely don't come to me. It's just, <laughs> I know like people it. watching is like, oh, this is such an example, but I will just... Uh, another another uh, tool watch is not 6541 that I just showed you, but 6542, mm, no which way. obviously is... Does it have a bracelet? Yes. Is it a Submariner? All right, close. Sea Dweller. More in the air. Air King. Fucking hell, bro. <laughs> it's a GMT Master. <laughs> 6542. I have this one. Just the, the modern one. Modern version. Yeah. Which well, you told I, me you look you you feel like a douche when you wear that. I feel watch, like right? a douche wearing it, yes. If you wear this watch, you won't feel like a douche. Yes. You feel like a sophisticated douche. A douche with more money. <laughs> so this is a backlight dial, guys. Backlight bezel, exactly. A bezel. But that's very Close. important <laughs> because the bezel alone is let's say a big part of the originality of the watch because it's the only watch with a backlight bezel with radium inside. So the watch is radioactive as fuck. Yeah. So this is a, a, as well a pristine condition What year watch. is it? Is uh, it 1958. 58, so four years after the launch of the GMT Master. Well, there you go, my friend. See? <laughs> but why is your Wikipedia open here? Uh... <laughs> I'm like Googling stuff. <laughs> no, that's, that's actually correct. Uh, and they made it with the, like radium dials or with luminous material, strontium 19 a, or- very uh... good condition, huh? I'm not, yeah. not joking, I, I mean it, it's, yeah. it looks immaculate. Good job on the repolishing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I did it myself, thank you. We're done with the tool watches because I showed you a couple tool watches of Rolex, which I very much adore, but I have one passion, and that is more in, in towards, let's say, the luxurious watches that were meant to be luxurious, and that's... Hublot. <laughs> Hublot, exactly. So the last three watches are Hublots. Uh, the fun thing about collecting data specifically is because there are so many configurations that are totally different. Yeah. Let's say with the Paul Newman, of course, you have different dials, but the, the uh, differences are minor. Yeah. With data, you have different bracelets, you have different finishes, different bezels, different dials, different diamond settings, different hands, different crowns. Everything can be changed because it's the flagship model. So yeah. it was one of the most expensive models always. And since I'm a gemologist, so I studied gemology, yeah. I can combine my passion of watches and gemstones that's, in that's the stone it. dial line. So this... Oh, this I know. Yeah. This dial is called a Jasper dial. And I should yeah. you not. Yeah. 
So it's a dark green dial, the color of Rolex. Uh, Jasper is a beautiful gemstone, and when it has... Uh... Of course it is. Eh? <laughs> I didn't even come up with a name, it's just it's the scientific name of I it. I thought it was uh, oxblood at the beginning. It's no, not no a... bloodstone. So bloodstone. Th that's a variety of Jasper, Chalcedony. Uh, where it has like these red inclusions, as mm -hmm. you can see. Yeah. When it does have these red inclusions, it's called a bloodstone. Uh -huh. uh, and this is housed in an 1802 8 case that has the smooth bezel and it has an um, oyster riveted oyster bracelet. So it doesn't look anything like your regular dated with the fluted bezel and the president bracelet, which I like because it's something odd. And this looks more normal, let's say, because without yeah, all the fluting. Down. Yeah. yeah. And it would look cool with your jacket, for example. For like sure. Green on green. So finally, some style. It's perfect, yeah. I like this style. I have here an Arabic they did. Oh, I like those even more. No, but this is next level stuff. It's iced out. <laughs> no diamonds here. I like I like gemstones, obviously. Uh, if they're factory set. If they're factory set. Or and set by you. Or set by you. Sure. <laughs> so this is a watch that has many aspects to it, why it's very special. I'm wondering if you can name them all. I mean, the bracelet, also the dial. The applied Hindu Arabic numerals and the day date is in Arabic. Yeah. And the hands are different as well. Yeah, so earlier hands, it's 1961, 1962, so it has a different shape like leaf hands. The dial itself, like the base plate, has a pattern to it, which is a guillotte pattern mm. that gives a very cool feeling, very dynamic in the lighting. That also is emphasized by the center link of the bracelet that also has like the stripes. Yeah, it's a continuous design. As far as I know, it's a unique bracelet. The, the watch is featured in the book of Pucci Papaleo, the dated book. It has the Eastern Arabic numerals applied to it. It's in pink gold, which is also special. So it's a, in total, it's a pretty special package. Oh, this is cool. This is very nice. And you always have some cool day dates available. I've seen. Yeah. I've yeah. seen upstairs some, not marble, but... How light. How light dials. Yeah. Some gem set dolls. Yeah, correct. So Pearl. day dates are kind of our specialty, let's say. We yeah. do sell a lot of them and we sold a lot of them. This one is not for sale, obviously. But we started out with day just watches mostly. Yeah. So four or five years ago, day just watches were our bread and butter. I think we sold, let's say, 20 to 30 every month. That's a lot. Um, and I still enjoy them a lot. My first day just 1601 in steel. I bought it when I was 16 with my hard earned cash. Yeah. Uh, and I still enjoy that watch very much. Of course, we have a different take here today with mm -hmm. the more valuable pieces. But there are a lot of watches you can find for a, a fairly normal amount. And yeah. I think the Datejust is a perfect watch for a guy that buys his first piece. Yeah, and it, with Datejust, they are slightly more uh, affordable than Datejust. You can play with like crazy dials, you know. I saw a soda light dial, which I really like. Yeah, which is like 15K. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. However, the one we have here is also a quarter million. It's yeah. a Datejust. Perhaps is the most expensive Datejust in the world. If you know a more expensive one, let well, me know. Rolex I'll buy it. No, just kidding. It, <laughs> that sounds so stupid. I'll buy it. No, this is a white gold Datejust, which is uh, fairly uh, unusual to say the least. Yeah. It was made in the 70s, also has a white gold Jubilee bracelet to it. So for me, it's just mind boggling that somebody went into the store and bought a watch that they could have bought in steel. Mm with the exact same configuration, but then paid like 10 times the price. Yeah. This guy chose to have the exact same configuration as a steel one, yet the dial is something else, and that's where the value is, because it's also stone dial. Oh, I know yeah. this one as well. It's good. Onyx Wait. dial. There you go. And obviously, Onyx, is it's, it's beautiful, because the jet black dial just... You lose yourself, you lose your thoughts in it. But you can feel the heaviness huh, of the case. Obviously, nice. the, the white gold is way, way heavier mm. than the steel one. Uh, but the ones on yellow gold, we've had numerous of times. This, they trade around, let's say, between 30 and 40. White gold, yeah, it's, it's 250K-ish. Yeah. Yeah, that's the value of the watch. Uh, again, it's not for sale, this one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty uncommon to see them in white gold. White metal uh, stone dials are uh, spectacular. Listen, what do you like the most and why? And what do you dislike the most and why? So out of these watches here, I kind of dislike the look of this. Although it's super cool, I'm not a fan of the bracelet with the watch. I like the dial though, I like the dial. Um, what I like the most maybe is uh, this Patek. Yeah, I thought so. Um, the reference number 5004 in platinum because it has a diamond at six o'clock. That's true. So yeah, this is uh, probably one of my favorites. Also, this is nice, the white gold Datejust because it's all like understated kind right? of. Right, yeah, it yeah. looks like a 5K watch to exactly. most of the people. Exactly. If you go outside, ask people like, what's the, the value? Like, nobody's gonna rob you, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a good thing with this watch. 
So with having all these watches and you also see pretty much every watch that existed so far, do you even have a, like an end all be all or is the concept not something you I don't feel like, like. that exists in, yeah. in some terms because sometimes I feel more like wearing a Cartier when I'm suited up or whatever. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm, I'm going to, let's say, the tennis club to watch a match because I, I'm in sports. Yeah. And then I rather wear my Plum Aquanaut so I can't choose just one watch. Yet I have some watches that I would like to change. For example, the 5004, I love the watch. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, it has to make way for 2499, like the older perpetual calendar chronograph, or 1563. That's a reference you guys have to Google, because it's like a 1463, like a Tassitoni, like the chronograph with the beautiful pushers, but then split second. So it's also pretty crazy. But yeah, that's like a 1 million euro watch or whatever. Yeah. So that's just too far out of my budget. But so far, I'm also happy to explore uh, different sites. You know, I have many Cartiers also. I just included one, but yeah. I love Cartier. I have many, for example, Cartier Tank Arrondi with the bracelet. But on some days, I'd rather go for a Dayjust. On some days, I'd rather go for a Gerald Genta, the one yeah. I showed you that I yeah. bought. Really cool. Um, thank you. So it, uh, there, there's not one watch. Yeah. It's the same, like, you could, yeah, what's I your agree. favorite food? Okay. Would you eat that every day? No, no, don't, no, for sure not. Yeah. Burek is the, it's the best. No, I, I, I actually agree with you. It's, it's getting harder and harder, like, to choose one. I sometimes say like a George, uh, George Daniels or Roger Smith in my mm -hmm. space would be like the end all be all because it's independent, it's handmade, you have to wait uh, 3000 years to get one. Just like a Daytona. Basically, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's probably easier to get a uh, Roger Smith and a ceramic <laughs> Daytona these days. No, but you're right. Seriously, those watches are insane. Yeah. Uh, and I definitely understand the beauty of that. I would be willing to, let's say, let go of the whole collection yeah. for one Roger Smith. Would this satisfy me? I think not, down the line. <laughs> that's the thing. Let's <laughs> that's that's be serious. Thing. But it's a, it's a good idea to have, maybe. <laughs> no, it's, that's true, that's true. But I like watches in many senses. Uh, for me, a uh, watch as uh, uh, George Daniels or uh, R.W. Smith doesn't appeal me in that fashion that I would spend that money. Yeah. Because for me, the value is in the soul of the watch, you know, the heart of the watch. Yeah. And I feel like historically, these speak to me more. Yeah. Uh, but definitely if I, for example, uh, when I'm in the auction weekend and I have this watch in my hand, uh, R.W. Smith or whatever, yeah. and you get the feeling like, whoa, this is crazy. Yeah. It's just not the, the way I get appeal to it, but I definitely understand it's in a different brand. Oh, for sure, for sure. Jasper, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. Pleasure was Ho mine. Hope you guys learned something new. Again, if you want to see more about vintage watches, check out his channels. He covers quite a lot of them from all the brands he loves especially Rolex and uh, what would you focus on as well? Patek? Patek, Cut Rolex. Case for sure as well. well. In the end, Rolex is my, my they are dearest to my heart. Yeah. And that's the watch I would wear the most of the times, but Patek, AP, uh, Cartier, some cool Vacherons, Breguet. I really like the Breguet that I showed you, the Rata yeah. that we the have. Yeah, Rata is really cool. That's a nice one. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not constricted to one brand, but I just feel like Rolex appeals to me most, vintage ones, so yeah. yeah. Perfect. So guys, comment down below which one is your favorite out of those watches here. Or also in general, what do you think about vintage watches versus new ones? Thank you for watching and as always, I'll see you next week. It was good, huh? It's good. Okay, now we do the real one. This was a... This was the test. This was the test. He didn't even record it. <laughs>